Hello and welcome. In the coming weeks, David Kinney and I will be introducing you to a set of new ideas and new approaches to basic questions in the humanities. Questions about how culture works and how it evolves and changes over time. Questions about people, how they tell stories and make sense of their worlds. Cultural analytics works hand in hand with traditional humanities scholarship. So we'll look at books and archives, novels and newspapers, court records, transcripts from parliamentary debates, and well beyond. We'll look at fan fiction that people write online or the blurbs on the back of books that can often tell us much more than you'd think. Cultural analytics is a fundamentally collaborative endeavor with people in the humanities working together with people in the sciences. So that means we expect you to have collaborators and it means that we're not going to teach you enough to replace a computer scientist. Our goal instead is to open the black box of this new field so that you can get a sense for the underlying ideas and philosophies. In this opening lecture, I'm going to give you a tour of what's possible. And I'm going to show you in three separate examples how we can get complementary insight into some of the basic questions that we ask, both as scholars and indeed as human beings. The first story begins, as many cultural analytics projects do, with an archive. So uh, this is an archive from the British government. The British government digitized uh, on the order of about 200,000 trial transcripts. This is something called the Proceedings of the Old Bailey. This means we actually had the Brits love keeping records, right? So this means we have um, for about 250 years, starting in 1674 uh, and going all the way through to 1913, which is uh, when we have this cut because of privacy reasons, um, we have a remarkably complete record of how the British governed themselves, at least how they governed themselves through the practice of criminal justice. Uh, one of the first trials, just for fun, one of the first trials in this data in 1674 is the trial of Jane, uh, Jane Kent, sorry, Jane Kent for witchcraft. She's actually acquitted. She's found not guilty of witchcraft. One of the last trials in the last volume that was digitized in 1913 uh, was a trial of the women's rights activist Emmeline Pankhurst, essentially for what today we'd call terrorism. Um, there are, yes, 200,000 trial transcripts, but that said, only about 100,000 are what we'd call reasonably reliable as transcripts, not reconstructions. And they fall between roughly 1770 and 1913. So essentially, modern attitudes to you know, open justice, open science, uh, open government, um, that doesn't really show up until, in fact, uh, John Wilkes in 1778 or so. Uh, but this gives us a lot to work with. And in fact, each of these transcripts gives us a view, uh, like a, just maybe in some cases, just a few minutes uh, into a particular moment, into a particular event that is of extraordinary power, at least for the people or some of the people who are participating in, uh, in the trial itself. So here's a sketch of what the courtroom looks like for most of our data. Um, this is indeed the Old Bailey or the old version of the Old Bailey. Um, the uh, you have sort of a standard layout, something you are familiar with from you know Law and Order or Broad Church or whatever. Um, just to be clear, right? Um, this is not you know there are great moments of of you know uh, legal history in our data, but a great deal of it is actually uh, mundane. It's the ordinary day to day grind of life. So I was looking at a, a transcript this morning. Uh, that, uh, here, oh, this is my paraphrase of it. So this, this gentleman is walking through Covent Garden. Actually, a lot of good trials begin in Covent Garden. This gentleman is walking through Covent Garden late at night, and he's approached by a madam um, who, uh, who says, oh, I, I can get you Jane. So they, uh, she takes him back to the, uh, the house, the, the house of the ladies' arm. And um, sets him up in a room, and the woman comes in, and they, you know, in the morning, um, this man refuses to pay, and he said, "Well, look, you know, I asked for Jane, and you didn't give me Jane, so I'm not going to pay." And at that point, all of these women burst through the door. I mean, this 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 this, this um, brouhaha starts, and these women burst through, and they pin him to the mattress, take a knife, and cut the purse out of his pants. Right. So um, he now presses charges for theft. Right. So this is somewhat. 
um, I, you know, somewhat, I don't know, I, uh, you can sort of hear the, 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 the laughter in the courtroom, even if it's not in the trial transcript itself. So um, I want to say there's, there's three ways to look at this trial. There's three ways for us to look at it. The first way is for us to see this as a story, as a narrative, uh, something that could appear in Tristram Shandy something that later these kinds of stories are gonna be written into novels by someone like Charles Dickens, right? So this is, uh, these are the raw material for the self-mythologizing, the storytelling that's gonna happen in this same nation state. Uh, in fact, actually our trial records, you say, well, you know, why do we have such great records? Uh, one of the reasons we have great records is that people love to read these. These are sort of an early version of, um, you know, cops or true crime. Uh, the transcripts actually make for great stories. So the first way to look at this is um, just as an occasion for narrative or as the emergence of a genre telling stories about crime. Uh, the second way to view this is perhaps the most natural way is as history. This trial is part of some longer term historical process. Uh, one might read this as part of the way the state comes to control and define people. The trial is a window into something, a window into how men see women at this point in time, or how the state sees women. Uh, how contracts work, right? Is it a problem this guy didn't pay, you know, for the, the woman he did spend the night with? How obligations work? What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? The, the Valtang Shang, the, 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 the ways in which people see the world they live in. But finally, uh, we might think of seeing this as a trial, uh, they might think of seeing this trial, sorry, as a, a information process, a process, a system of interconnected signals and correlations, the ways in which people are using words and giving signals about other words that other people are going to use, signals about the context in which that particular trial is taking place. So this may seem a little mysterious at the moment. This is the perspective that we can take now that the data has been digitized, right? So we've always had these records. We've always had the proceedings of the Old Bailey that were now digitized, fortunately. But because they've been digitized and because we can now apply some of the methods of computational analysis, we have this third view in. We have this third way to look at what's happening at this particular event and this particular sequence of events that is a, what we might think of as an information theoretic view. That view, as we'll see, gives us a lot of insight. It helps us understand the kinds of stories that end up getting told. And certainly it ends up giving us a deeper sense of the kinds of historical processes that are unfolding. So, okay, we call this an information process. That's a bit cold-blooded. So I actually, I, for this, I, I, all the great trials have the word Covent Garden in them if, if you want the sort of scandalous one. So here, this is a great one, um, a few years after the one that I began this, this, this talk with. So this is um, a case brought against Emma Smith and Mary Byrne, uh, Emma and Mary, uh, by uh, Henry Korff. So Henry Korff, actually, he's a school teacher. Um, he's, he's visiting London from the Isle of Wight. And uh, he's staying, okay, he's staying in Covent Garden. And he says, well, you know, at 11.30 at night, this is the testimony he's giving. 11.30 at night, I was, I was heading back to my hotel. And these two ladies uh, said, well, you know, why don't you want to buy us a drink? And um, he said, well, I, um, I wished them to pursue a better course. This is what Mr. Corp says. I wished them to pursue a better course. And in fact, Emma, it turns out, might be sort of more open to this. And uh, Smith, Emma Smith, says she should be very happy to do so. But, you know, I, I understand I might lose my friends. You know, I have a whole gang here. Um, I, um, I, I walked with them, he says, Mr. Corp says. I, I walked with them conversing on that subject and then went to their lodgings. I went back to their house in a court near the theater and I must have remained there three or four hours. I sat on the bed, he says, and this, this is kind of wonderful. And in fact, at some point, this, this great moment, so there, there's this cross-examination. How long, Mr. Corf, how long did your moral lecture continue? I, I, I don't remember, but I am a, I'm a sober and I'm a married man. 
So um, these are the fun ones. This is quite fun. No one, nothing bad actually happens to anybody here. But um, this is the, what I've highlighted in blue here is as close as we have a record of this event, a record of this thing that transpired. Um, the I don't mean the whatever Corf and Emma and Mary ended up doing, but I would. This is this moment in the Old Bailey where this person's getting up in front of the power of the state and talking, and other people are talking. If Mr. Barry is talking as well. And we're going to see this, we're going to look at this, not as a, it's a great story, right? It's a very embarrassing story. Um, I think Korf, I think Korf is actually, I think he's so gormless that actually this is, he's completely, he's not making any of this up at all. It's exactly what happened. Um, so, but he's telling this story and what we're going to ask is, how does the, this, this story that's unfolding, the talk that's unfolding, how does this correlate with, how does this predict the indictment? The, the actual formal record being made of the crime that was committed. So we're going to ask about the relationship between these two things, between this sort of dramatic human moment, like God bless you, Mr. Corp, between this dramatic human moment and the formal record that's going to sit there and define Emma and Mary's future. So I will leave it up. You can look this up and see what happened to Emma and Mary. Um, this is happening at a point where they could actually, God forbid, get sent to America. Um, the, the thing I'm proposing here, the way I'm proposing, this third way I'm proposing to look at this, is to look at this, this event as part of a signal system. So what's a signal, very roughly speaking? A signal is, you know, asking how much of a signal is there is saying, how much does one thing tell you about another? Very simply, and in our case, we're asking, how much does what is said during the trial so that event, right, that actual substantive thing, how much is what it said during the trial, the testimony, the back and forth, what everybody's saying in front of the jury and the judge, how much does the trial, let's say, as event, tell you about what the trial is actually for, and in this case, meaning how the state ends up classifying the problem. So the relationship between the trial as this dramatic, let's say, event, and the trial as part of the machinery of empire and the machinery of state. So, um, you know, here are your, tra I can't resist this. Here's another Covent Garden transcript um, where, you know, someone's going through Covent Garden. And I mean, there's the Apple store now, but this is back in the day, it was a, a different scene. How much does um, the transcript, this story being told, correlate with or inform you about the indictments? Right, so this is okay. This is this is Sophie and Anne. These are the new these are the new people who are drawn up for feloniously stealing in this case. So we're going to measure. We're going to try and measure. We're going to quantify the extent to which the talk correlates with the classification, the people on the stage, and the 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 faceless, the Foucauldian you know system of power. We're going to simplify this problem. We're going to talk about this in terms of a binary classification. So we're going to say, how much does the stuff in the trial document, the transcript, how much does it tell you? Not about you know, every detail of the indictment, but how much information does it give you about whether, on the one hand, the indictment is for what we, we would think of as a violent crime, so assault or battery or what they classify as violent theft, or conversely, a nonviolent offense, so larceny or theft or burglary. So just to drag this out, right? We're going to say I have access. I got access to the transcript. I can't see what the trial is for formally. I can't tell what the what the actual indictment is for. All I can do is see, or in fact, hear. I can hear what's going on in the courtroom. How much does that tell me? How strong is the signal? for what the state thinks is going on. So at this point, and only now at this point, do we actually switch on the machine, right? So everything we've done so far is historical reasoning, philosophical reasoning, um, you know, to kind of tease apart a question, phrase a new one. And now we're gonna use the machine to measure the extent to which these two things are correlated, the extent to which if you know the transcript, you know the indictment. So what we're gonna do now is plot over the course of time, we're going to plot the signal strength, the, the power of the indictment to tell you what's in the transcript, or equivalently, it turns out, the power of the transcript to tell you what the indictment is. 
So we're going to plot this over the course of the data that we think is reliable, so beginning around 1750 going up to 1913. On the x-axis here is just years, that's just ticking by, right? On the y-axis is this signal strength. Don't worry about the units, right? Just higher means stronger, meaning more predictable, right? What this means is that uh, if we're going up this axis here, the higher we are on the y-axis, Right. the stronger the signal is. So let's let's unfold this. I'm going to reveal the data to you. I mean, this is, you know, three people and, and years of, of, of blood and sweat, or mostly years of trying to figure out what on earth this new field is. Uh, focus here just on the blue line, right? All you need to see is that the blue line is going up. And so if we go around like 1780, the blue line is very low, and in fact, it's consistent with literally no distinguishing power. So what that means is that, and this is at the one word level, so to be technical, this means is if you go in and you just hear a fragment of the trial, right? you just hear a couple things like, you know, uh, Mr. Korf is like, uh, you sat on the bed, right? He's just, just a little fragment. That fragment actually gives you very little information about what the actual crime at stake is. Not what happened, but what that's going to end up being classified as. So early on, there's no distinction. Later, by the time you get to the late 1800s, early 1900s, in fact, you now have a strong distinction. So everything is in here, right? Every, every sort of story about the signal is in here. And what we're seeing, in fact, is that in the latter half of the 1800s, there's somehow more information in the event about what the state thinks is going on. So we can think of this, we call this an emergent signal. So one way to explain this, or one way to talk through this, and of course you have to make, a, you have to make an argument at this point, you've got some quantitative story, you now tie this together to a historical explanation. One explanation for what's going on here is that there's a, a profound shift in the way in which the court is being used and the role that the court is playing in governance, right? So early on, let's say 1760, 1770, 1780, right? Early on, for most crimes that go through the Old Bailey, most crimes are actually not of particular interest for the state itself to monitor. Really what's going on here is that individuals are going head to head over something like, you stole, you stole my money, right? Um, the, the court is a sort of a, a place where those battles are being fought out between individuals. By the time the 1800s end, by the time the 19th century ends and we enter into the, the modern era, now what's happening is the state is getting involved. And in fact, the indictment, and in particular, whether or not the indictment is tracking a violent or nonviolent offense, this becomes a crucial feature of the way in which the state gets involved. You can't simply bring charges against somebody because you want to get your money back. Um, if you punch someone in the face, the problem is now between you and him and the state because the government at this point is now attempting to get control of what you might call the state's monopoly on violence. What's interesting about all of this is in fact, much of the state control over lethal violence has already happened by the time we're seeing this new signal emerge. Uh, the extent to which the state concerns itself, for example, with murder, gets involved in murder cases, it's no longer a personal thing, right? This is a, this is a crime that's going to be tracked. But these weaker things, right, like you get, you, you get beat up in the brothel, right? Um, at this shift from 1780 to, let's say, 1880, the shift over about 100 years, is the point at which the state is getting involved in monitoring, tracking, and teasing apart, regulating forms of violence that were previously sort of below the radar. What this is doing, in other words, is tracking a long time scale cultural shift, something that from day to day is sort of invisible to the, the reader. This is not something you can see in any particular trial, but only upon drawing together tens or hundreds of thousands of trials can you see what you might think of as this shift towards a, a new form of control that's visible in the courtroom process. 
uh, in our paper, so this is Sarah Klingenstein, Tim Hitchcock, one of the, actually the leads um, on the, the uh, development of the the intellectual and technical apparatus underneath the Old Bailey, along with Robert Shoemaker, a bunch of other uh, people in the United Kingdom and beyond. Um, so Sarah and Tim and I tried to put this into a larger context, uh, into a larger context of historical sociology, and in particular. Um, a classic book by uh, a historian called Norbert Elias called The Civilizing Process. So you can read more about that in our paper. Um, let me finish this first example here um, with one of the key questions, one of the key issues that will come up in our class as the weeks unfold. And this is this question of what we think of as operationalization. It's a terrible word. Um, what we want to do very often when we view a trial or any kind of event through this third lens, not through the literary narrative lens, not through the historical, political, scientific, uh, sociological lens, but through this third lens as a system of signals, um, what we're going to do is often take something that you might call a thick concept, right? So, you know, here's a concept, the extent to which the state considers itself to hold a monopoly on violence and the extent to which the state uses the cultural uh, apparatus it has to hand to regulate and control this, right? So this is a thick, deep, this is you know, volumes and PhDs, right? We're going to take that concept and we want to turn that into, right, a, and this is awful, a measurable, simple quantifiable tracer okay, so that we can measure some aspect of that deep concept in a surface level simply by things like counting and taking ratios, right? The particular mathematical details are not that interesting or important at this stage. The question is, how, what kind of tracer can we find? Right? In this case, our tracer, and one has to make an argument for this, a tracer is the ways in which the talk of the individuals and the categories of the state come into increasing alignment. Now, that operationalization process, of course, when you do it, starts to, uh, leads you at least to reflect upon the original thick concept that you originally had in mind. And so, in fact, the, operation, the operationalization stage is not simply from thick to, let's say, thin, but in fact, a kind of cyclical process, like this is the hermeneutic cycle for cultural analytics, where you're constantly going between, let's be informal about it, a deep idea and a trivial one, right? And by looking at the trivial quantifiable version, you might see things, you might see these kinds of patterns, which then cause you to go back and say, well, is this really the case, right? Is it really the case that these in this increasing level of distinctiveness between nonviolent and violent trials is really cottoning on to changes in attitudes at the level of the individual or the level of the system itself, changing attitudes towards the violent, nonviolent distinction. So this, this hermeneutic cycle is something that we'll see over and over again. You know, roughly speaking, the questions we have are, you're operating like, like, does it work? Have you actually captured the kind of concept you want to have in play? How do you know it works? What are the possibilities? Can you take it further? And then perhaps more importantly, what are the limits? So this is our first example. It's an example uh, that gives us an introduction to some of the basic problems. Um, our second example, this is work with Tatiana Gershkovich and Madeline Kell. So Tatiana is uh, with me at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, she's in the Department of Modern Languages, a scholar of Russian literature. And Madeline Kell, so she was at University of Pittsburgh in the psychology department. Um, uh, Tatiana and Madeline both speak Russian, I do not. So this second project, uh, again, many of these stories begin with a story about a database. In this case, it's a database of diaries. So this is Projito, a project run um, through the University of St. Petersburg, which has gathered together an enormous archive of Russian Soviet diaries between you know early like actually late 1800s to the 2000s and up to the present day what they've done here is they've taken an enormous number of diaries and uh carefully and rigorously as part of a, an open science citizen science project digitize them typing them in categorizing them getting everything right getting all the details right so projecto has uh, 1700 authors a uh, total of 4,000 diaries, because sometimes people start and stop diaries and count it separately. And in the end, nearly half a million 
diary entries. So if you read Russian, here's an example. Most of the examples here how we will translate, right? But this is this woman. She was born in 1914. Uh, she dies in 1997. We have her diary entries beginning in the 1930s. Here's just an example that the opening there is a, is a little clip from a popular song. She's just reflecting on uh, telling stories about her life and the way we use diaries. So then, of course, the question is, well, um, you know, what actually do we do when we keep a diary? And perhaps more interestingly, or at least more tractably, um, how do people who keep diaries understand the act of diary writing? So um, when we try to sort of make sense of this, you, you might look, for example, at some of the famous diary keepers. So Leo Tolstoy, um, what is a diary, a convenient way to evaluate the self? And what he means by evaluate there is more like kind of grade yourself. Like, are you progressing to, you know, some spiritual, um, you know, uh, apex? Um, this is Kafka. Kafka is uh, a diary is a means to see with reassuring clarity the changes which you constantly suffer. So for Kafka, it's almost like this motion picture of one's soul. Uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, Virginia Woolf's diaries, uh, Virginia Woolf's diaries, uh, my diary is a kindly blank faced old coffee don. So what we're going to do is approach this, this question, this research question, and this is a question both uh, a question of history, diary writing as a historical act, as a practice, a cultural practice, but also a literary act in the sense it's a sort of a, a hybrid genre. It's a genre in some sense, it's storytelling, but it's also this something else, personal record keeping. Um, we're going to use the Persito archive to get a new window into this question. So we do this with, uh, I, this, I say this is a very clever approach, uh, this very clever approach that uh, Tatiana, Madeline, and I uh, came up with, which, and this is our operationalization, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the patterns of word usage. We're gonna go through these half a million diary entries with our machine. We're gonna go through half a million diary entries and we're going to just yank out the sentences and the entries that literally have the word diary in them. If we want to understand, in other words, this is our bargain, if we want to understand how people reflect upon or think about what a diary means, right, let's look at the sentences where they actually simply use the word, right? So then, you know, this is, you might think of this as an operationalization. We're trying to operationalize this very evanescent, ephemeral moment of reflection. And the way we're going to operationalize it is by looking at the words that sit around, literally just in physical proximity to the word diary, right? So we're going to, like, you know, we're going to miss plenty of things which we can talk about, uh, but this is our bargain. So what happens when you do this? Well, here's an example. This is um, uh, just a clip from one of the many hundreds of thousands of, of entries we have. And this is an entry or a sentence here that contains the word diary. I'll read it to you. My fate, if there is such a thing, it turns out one cannot be without skepticism even within one's own diary. My fate probably, like that of many other people, is a life with merciless logic pursuing insignificant goals. So this is a diary entry from Sergei Sergeev, uh, captain of the Soviet Navy. Uh, this entry was made in 1941, in fact, when he was piloting an icebreaker through the Arctic Sea. So this is, I, this is as Tatiana said, I can't imagine this is so Russian, right? This is, you know, it's like out of Solaris, this you know, Soviet man at the, you know, this technological apex. And he, he said, life, what is it? You know, a life of merciless logic, our fate grinding us down and pursuing insignificant goals. So um, one could write many poems about this, but we're going to just stuff this into the machine. And what we're going to do is we'll take all of these entries, every entry, not just surrogates, we take all of these entries and ask the machine to say, for each of these entries, find me common patterns, find me styles of talking about diary simply based upon the words that are used around it. So when we do this, right, we've plugged this through the machine and, you know, the details, um, what we're trying to let's focus now just on the conceptual apparatus out the other side and with a lot of work by madeline mostly uh by, out of a lot of work the machine says you know there are five types of diary entry of these self-reflective things that you've given me and in fact this one uh, tatiana named this uh this type of diary this category of entry we're going to call this 
the spirit category. So this is a pattern of word usage right, associated with the diary as a tool for spiritual development. Now, the, the computer didn't call it spirit. Tatiana called it spirit, right? Uh, what it actually has done is said, look, here's all your entries. There are five categories. Here's this category, and here are all of the entries that also fall in this category on the basis of the word patterns. And we examine these entries and we see, we look at them and we find similarities. So here's a few other examples of uh, diary entries, reflective, like reflective or reflexive entries about diaries. So this is um, in 1947, this is Valerian, a secretary. I had the desire to write my diary, to be alone with my thoughts, to again come to terms with my solitude. Here's an example. This is uh, Tatiana Colina, an accountant writing in 1996. To avoid obsessing about my petty pain, I will write in my diary. Uh, the final example, these are just drawn from our, our uh, preprint. This is our final example. This is uh, Militza. Uh, she's 14 years old. She's writing in 1915, classified uh, within the same category. As it happens now, while still affected by yesterday's confession, I can express one of the reasons I'm compelled to write my diary. So uh, what we're seeing here is this is a sort of rough, hopefully rough validation that these entries are, the machine is cottoning onto a certain kind of style of reflection. In each of these cases, and you sort of dig through more and more of them, you, you see, you interpret the surface level patterns that the machine has discovered. And in this case, the, the final classification we came up with was entries falling into this category are treating the diary as a mechanism for spiritual development. All right, so what are the other categories? I said there were five. So here's, here's Sergei, right? Um, so this is Sergei's um, you know, diary as mechanisms for spiritual development. Um, here's another example. This is uh, Nikolai uh, Kozakov, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, after I came home, mom and I made dinner. She brought onions and radishes and salad and I chopped them up and dressed them with vinegar. There were potatoes and meat for dinner. We ate, those walks made me very hungry. And with great appetite, I drank tea and began to write my diary. I finished reading a book of poetry by Nekrasov that mom had brought, read two chapters from Nekrasov, who was happy in Russia, went to bed at 11. So, uh, you know, if Sergei is one classic Russian diary entry, you know, eating, uh, you know, chopping potatoes and, and onions and radishes with mom is perhaps another one. Um, I've colored this red, it, you know, perhaps happily does not fall, at least according to the machine, into the spirit category. But it falls into a different category. The patterns of word usage dump this entry into a different category that we ended up naming routine. So entries that fall or classified by a machine in this category are entries concerned with the diary as part of just day-to-day -day life. It's the furniture, the, the sort of eventual furniture of life. Um, I won't give you other examples of, you know, the same way I walked you through, you know, sort of spiritually agonizing Russians over a hundred years. We won't, we won't do um, uh, the, you know, the routines of Russian life, but there it is. Um, there are, as I said, there are five categories in total. Um, uh, another category is uh, what we call the literary category. So these uh, collected entries that in many ways are quite similar to entries that were seen in the spirit category, but by inspection and also by looking at the terms themselves, um, we see that the entries that fall here are sort of a more self-conscious form of spiritual reflection very often. they are an awareness that the diary is also in some way reminiscent of a literary object, of a story. Uh, in some cases, people being aware that people like, for example, Tolstoy have kept diaries themselves. So comparing them or reflecting upon the idea that a diary might be a work of literature. Um, the, uh, the, the fourth category uh, we called form or material form. So uh, this, these are entries that refer to the diary itself as a material object. So this is one, uh, one of our examples. I mean, some of them are like, my diary is, you know, is bulging at the seams. There's 55 pages in it. Uh, it's full. There's a beautiful one, actually. You know, my, um, this entry, my, my friend, um, uh, you know, this, this, this entry is written in a, with a certain piece of paper with a certain kind of structure to it, like a certain material object. Um, the one example we, we use um, in the preprint is, um, and I'll quote it to you, um, with this entry written in pencil, my diary comes to resemble an expedition journal, written in pencil, resemble an expedition journal. 
Ink on the front lines is an unnecessary luxury for the average fighter. This is a diary entry written in 1942, in fact, by a man who will become one day a famous philologist. We have both the famous and um, the, the, let's say, ordinary uh, in our entries. Um, finally, um, the, the final category, and this was a strange one for me, uh, but not for those who understand uh, the Russian traditions. Uh, we call this the interpersonal category. So in fact, these are entries which talk about people sharing their diaries, um, imagining what it would be like for somebody else to read their diaries, or in fact, talking about how they allowed someone to read their diary, how they read someone else's diary. So one of the really beautiful examples here is um, just before World War II, where someone writes, you know, my, my uh, friend, um, while she was reading this diary, uh, dripped a little bit of candle wax on it, right? So in that case, it's a little bit of a mixture, in fact, of the diary as, a, as an object. But in this case, the machine classified it as interpersonal, in part on the basis of words that in the end told it that this person was understanding the diary as a way to make contact with another human. So not as a private object, but a, a, a way of reading, and this is a, a, a sort of a, a practice that exists certainly in the Russian tradition, the, this idea of reading diaries, sharing them among a circle of friends and family. So uh, what has the machine done for us? It's, it's, it's found within all these entries, these, these in, within all these reflections, it's teased apart these reflections into five distinct kind of categories, patterns of word usage that we were then able to interpret. And, you know, by sort of laboriously going through and saying, give me more and more of these spirit categories. Do they make sense? Okay, now give somebody else these examples. Do they, you know, do we put them all in the same box? So trying to make sure that we're, we're not over-interpreting, but give us, you know, give us the, 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 the hope that we've done this in some way that we've correctly operationalized, in some way reverse operationalized this, this problem. There's this very obvious and pressing question, which is, how did the fractions of these usages evolve, right? Um, are there periods, and our data go over the 20th century, are there periods where, for example, the diary is used when people talk about the diary, they, they talk about it primarily as a mechanism for spiritual reflection? Are there periods where the diary, everybody is thinking of the diary as a literary object? We're all proto-writers. Are there times when the diary is simply, you know, it's just all you do is talk about the routine. You keep your, you keep your soul out of it. What are these, what are the epics or the eras, the fluctuations and how the diary is understood? Um, here's, here's our result. So uh, as always on the x-axis is time. We go from 1900 to 2000. On the y-axis are the fractions. And what we've done here is color each of the five categories um, uh, differently. So um, in the spirit category, and so here's, here's you know, the entry um, from our, our, the captain of the icebreaker, my fate, you know, um, uh, this sort of meaningless fate to which we will all be ground down into, right? So he makes an entry in 1941, it falls into the spirit category, and so it serves to make that, that purple group a little larger. Uh, in 1963, uh, mom and I made dinner together. I, you know, she gave me a book. I read, I read, read wrote my diary. Uh, that's fitting in the routine category there. Um, so what I want you to see is, um, well, let's take a look, for example, at routine. Um, in the first decade, uh, between 1900 and 1910, about 20% of all diary entries that reflect upon the diary um, reflect upon the diary as an element of their routine. Between 1910 and 1920, it's about 10%. And in fact, you look as this sort of evolves over time, essentially about 10% of all diary entries, regardless of the time, understand the diary is just part of one's routine. Then we go up to spirit. Well, it looks about like 40%. So the height of that spirit bar there is about 40%. Um, in 1900, about 40% of the reflective entries about diaries consider the diary as a vehicle for spiritual improvement or at least spiritual understanding. And it's the same fraction in 1920 and 1940. 1960, 1980. And in fact, really, other than, you know, modulo some sort of mildly dull statistics, basically what we see here is in fact, there is no change 
at least at this level, that in fact the ways in which Russian writers or people writing in Russia or the Soviet Union, the ways in which they talk about their diary is in fact remarkably stable over time. Right? So this is a story in part about the diary, let's say as a genre, um, the way that people talk about the diary, the, the extent to which the diary serves as a, uh, a source of spiritual improvement, or the way in which one sort of self-consciously thinks of the diary as a literary object, the way in which one thinks about how, you know, if I showed my wife my diary today, don't, right, but I showed my wife my diary today. This is, this is it's the same fractions. Diary writers, decade after decade, actually, like you're in the siege of Leningrad in World War II, right? You think you're going to, I mean, the horrible things are going to happen, right? Um, or you're at the, you know, you're in 1900, you're before, you know, you're 1915, you're like Militsa, right? You're, um, it's the tail end of war and peace, right? The Decemberists are barely over. Um, or it's, you know, it's, it's, it's 1991 and you're, you're watching the tanks roll into Red Square. Um, the, the, this practice is stable. It actually, it's this, the rock in the midst of it all. Um, you know, we freak out about this. Uh, Tatiana Madeline and I sort of freaked out about this, and we thought about this a lot. In fact, we spent a lot of time. So, for example, uh, we thought, well, what if this is just some artifact of, you know, the ways in which we, uh, you know, the, the sort of classification mechanism. So one of the things we looked at was, well, you know, if people, how people reflect on diaries is pretty constant. Let's look at how they reflect on essays and manifestos. And now we don't need to go into the details of each of these categories, but the only thing you need to see is that they're changing dramatically uh, in this wild way. So, for example, the uh, the you know people when they talk about essays in you know let's say the 70s or the 80s or the 2000s, their talk often falls into this style of reminiscence. If they talk about manifestos and essays in the 1920s, the 1930s, they're often concerned with that materiality question. But there's these huge shifts. Whereas the diary, by contrast, is incredibly stable. So that's our second example. Uh, we'll just sort of review where we are here so far. The first thing we've done, and we've talked about signal. So we introduced a project about looking at the ways in which the British governed or failed to govern themselves. Uh, over the course of about 200 years or so, the way we looked into that was through a question, seeing these trials as a signal system, as an information system. And we looked at how one aspect of this, this practice predicted or signaled another aspect. The second uh, investigation here into the nature of diary keeping, or at least the, the reflective process, the self-understanding of diary keeping, this was something that thought in terms of patterns. We use the machines not to measure signal strengths, but to discover patterns. And these patterns, one hopes, if they operationalize correctly, if the hermeneutic cycle works out, these patterns are actually hooking into thick concepts, habits and practices, methods of thought, the ways in which we perceive the world. And the scale of this work enables us to say some, to me, thrilling, but also potentially counterintuitive aspects of, of how diary keeping works. Now, in both of these cases, right, we are seeing ourselves, this kind of work is not in competition with more traditional forms of scholarship, but you might think of as providing complementary information. So just to give you an example, in the case of diary keeping, it is certainly the case that the meaning of keeping a diary shifted dramatically over the hundred years we have in consideration, right? So just to take the example, right, during the siege of, of, of Leningrad, um, the Soviet government encouraged people, sort of ordinary citizens, to keep diaries as part of the record of this event. Um, diary keeping is a, you know, a, an ideological practice within the communist period, or at least certain points in the communist period, just as much as, you know, perhaps earlier people might have in mind models like Tolstoy, uh, even going back, let's say, to the confessions or to some enlightenment tradition of self-examination. So the what we see here is this kind of complementary view, which sees not the dramatic shifts of conceptualization, but some of the crazy stability. So even if these diaries are changing in a lot of ways, we're also seeing that just the actual practice, the actual sort of on the ground writing is stable. That 10% of all the diary entries that talk about diary, you should check your own diary, see if this is fitting, right? About 10% fit routine, at least in this, in this particular continuity of culture. 
All right, so signals, patterns, and our final example, this is from work with um, Alexander Barron, Jenny Huang, Rebecca Spang, uh, and myself. This is um, taking this question of patterns uh, to the next step. So the, the second example here showed you some of the powers, the ways in which machines can actually discover meaningful interpretable features of, of a practice. Uh, this final example is um, about the ways in which we can see patterns not just being made and preserved, but also patterns being crashed and broken. So uh, our data here, our big data set in this case, comes from the French Revolution. And in fact, it comes from transcripts. They're, the story of how these transcripts came to be is, is amazing. They're reconstructed, but in some rigorous way. Uh, they end up uh, passing through the French government, through um, a long series of French historians. They go across to Stanford and they come out the other side and they end up uh, with us and they end up on our machine. So these are transcripts of the debates that happened in the National Constituent Assembly. So this is at the beginning of the French Revolution um, when all of the, let's call them the elites, are in the debating chambers or in the tennis court, they're in Versailles. And what they're doing is they're talking about, well, Christ, um, here we are. Um, it looks like we're going to have a revolution. What's that all about? Um, I'll just zoom in here. Um, my French is not particularly good. My colleague's French is better. Uh, most of the French that you'll see on the screen soon will just be run through Google Translate just for reasons of speed. Uh, but here's what happens day to day as um, people attempt to run um, the largest nation in Europe at the time, um, as no one has ever done before along Enlightenment principles. Um, here's, here's one exchange. This is uh, Monsieur Goupilot and Monsieur Gonsin. Um, the first thing I should say, by the way, revolutions, it turns out from the transcripts, revolutions are really boring. They're like the world's worst faculty meeting. Um, Gupala is, you know, begins like, I would like to, you know, oppose this, this project, this decree that you've, you've presented by the committee. I mean, it just, this is incredibly tedious, um, you know, tens of thousands of speeches that are being made in the minutia of how you put together a completely new society from the top down. Um, not all, um, uh, not all of the exchanges, not all the transcripts are boring or completely boring. I'll just read this one. Uh, this is essentially where chaos breaks out of the chamber. Uh, Monsieur Mellouet says, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to speak on that. And then actually there's a little stage direction in the transcript. Someone says there's a great number of, of murmurs. Um, order, order. Um, someone else says, uh, you, don't, you don't have the right to speak. Um, a third person says, uh, Mr. President, I would like to have a word about the way in which you're actually doing your duties here. You're meant to be regulating this discussion. It's a disaster. The original person, Mr. Mellowey, says, I just, have, I just got four things to say, more murmurs. Uh, Mr. Regineau is, you know, I would, I think the way in which, you know, Mr. Merlin is, is posing this question, um, you know, yelling from the left wing, why are you talking, uh, you know, murmur from the center, let him speak. Uh, so you can see there's, you know, in the same way perhaps we have in the Old Bailey, these transcripts are a combination of tedium and drama, of human drama, historical, you know, world historical events, as Hegel would say, but also just, um, you know, I, um, I, I would object to this amendment that you made to the previous amendment. So this is our raw material. This is our raw stuff. These are our events. And again, we can see these in many different ways. We can see these as narratives of stories, right? Uh, you know, I mean, everybody was watching this. Tom Paine is watching this. Mary Wollstonecraft is watching this from a hotel, like get out of town. Uh, but of course, we also see these as um, uh, signals of a historical process, as the, the flow of power, uh, the emergence of new ways, the emergence of the very idea of revolution. Um, we're going to see this in a third way, this kind of cultural analytics way. And in fact, what we're going to do, we're going to begin by asking the machine to find patterns in each of these speeches. So let's just go back to uh, the previous case. Uh, where um, Tatiana, Madeline, and I asked the machines to find patterns in diary entries, these reflexive diary entries. And in that particular method, the details, not, um, not an issue here, we're trying to get a sense of the overall idea. Um, the, uh, each of these entries is uh, given a particular category, right? So Sergei's entry is classified, this is spirit, right? Uh, Nikolai Kozakov's uh, entry, this is classified as routine. Uh, in this case, we're going to do a slightly different kind of pattern finding. 
And what we're going to do here is for all of these speeches, each speech, we're going to decompose them into a combination of patterns. So any particular speech, like here's Moshe Gossin, right? Um, his speech is not, we're not going to assign it, oh, it's pattern six or pattern two or form or spirit. We're going to, we're actually going to de decompose and say, look, these, these patterns are kind of weights, right? So Moshe Gossin, this particular speech is, you know, it's 25% pattern five, 70% pattern 22, 5% pattern 17. Um, just as in the case of the Russian diaries, we're not going to impose the patterns from the outside. We're going to say, we're going to ask the machine, like, look at all of the ways in which these words are fitting together. Can you find general themes in the ways in which they do? Um, the particular method we're using here is called, it's called topic modeling. So essentially, and very roughly speaking, what a topic model does is you feed it, in this case, 40,000 speeches, and you say, find me 100 word patterns, and it will indeed do that. And it will take each document, in this case, each speech, and decompose it into one of those 100 patterns. So what are those patterns? One way to get a sense of this sort of internal representation of the machine is to then say, okay, look, machine, um, thank you for finding all these patterns. Um, uh, give me some examples in this case, give me some examples of speeches that are really heavily weighted on the pattern. Like you say, pattern 17, well, I don't know what pattern 17 is. It's a bunch of, you know, it's a, sort of this machine representation, but uh, I, help me understand it. So give me some examples. So here's a case um, of the 100 patterns, pattern 17, uh, you tell the machine, give me some examples from the French Revolution, the debates of the French Revolution, that are heavily weighted on pattern 17, and it will give you a bunch of speeches. And so Alexander, uh, Jenny, Rebecca, and I sort of ground through a bunch of these. Um, so pattern 17, we asked the machine to give us lots and lots of examples, and eventually we realized that pattern 17 was essentially tracking the pattern of people talking about, roughly, the powers and the abilities of the state to conduct war. So here's an example speech. Uh, we said, machine, give us a speech heavy on pattern 17 and actually gave us a speech by Robespierre. Um, and I will not read the French to you. My French is terrible. Um, but you can see if you look either at the French itself or the translation that um, this is an example. This is a speech here where the Robespierre is talking about or arguing about the uh, almost the philosophical position of whether or not a state is uh, able to conduct war, whether it's the proper vessel by which peace and war is made. Um, that's not the only speech that leads us to title it this way. So we go through with many, many of these examples. We look for the words they have in common and the ways in which they fit together to give the this pattern, we call this topic, a name. Um, here's another example of a pattern. This is pattern 91. The numbers are arbitrary. Uh, pattern 91 is actually quite close to pattern 17. Pattern 17 was about the powers and the abilities of the state to conduct a war. In this case, it's actually about the general powers of the king. The particular example of the speech, this is by Jean-Baptiste Chaubrand, uh, is uh, the particular example here is in fact the power of the king to conduct war. Um, so in fact, this pattern co-occurs or appears with other speeches that have 17. Um, this is a great pattern that emerges. Uh, if you know um, some of the rough history of the French Revolution, including the, the turn towards the terror, the emerging paranoia, uh, this is speech pattern 21 that's correlated with speeches that are talk about or are concerned with threats to the nation from inside, in particular from appointed officials. Um, so an example of a speech heavily weighted on Jean-Francois Roubel, or sorry, I, I, this is an example of a speech by Jean-Francois Roubel, it's heavily weighted on this pattern. Um, another example, um, now going from the semantic to some of the more sort of structural, this is a pattern associated with making logical arguments. So pattern 94, and here's a very heavily weighted speech, this is uh, Gerard Lallé Tolendal. Um, this is sort of a very um, sort of kind of nerdy kind of computer science guy speech. Uh, it's so heavily loaded in pattern 94, there's almost nothing less except making a logical argument. But to give a sense of how this pattern recognition works, it's very possible that one might see pattern 21, threats to the nation, um, in a speech along with pattern 94, in which case you'd have an example of a speech that mixed a certain pattern of logical argumentation with a certain semantic concern with you know, enemies from within. Um, 
Our final example, and this is, you know, we go from the um, revolutionary paranoia to, you know, sort of computer science guy, logical argument to, in this case, this very, um, you know, high school debate, um, bureaucratic Robert's Rules of Order, um, uh, you know, pattern associated with arguing about procedure. Okay. So uh, if you get into this, and we did, you can spend your life looking and enjoying and sort of savoring each of these patterns. What we're going to do here, once we've convinced ourselves that these classifications are working reasonably well, is we're going to ask a question about predictability in debate. So we can see now we have not only each speech and not only the kind of rough patterns that appear in each speech, these categories. So we can say, ah, this speech is somebody, um, you know, arguing about procedure that concerns the powers of the state or any other number of combinations. We also have the sequence, the order in which this debate unfolds. So we can ask questions like the following, like how do patterns in this particular speech here predict the patterns in the speech that comes next, or of course, vice versa. We can ask, in other words, about the relationship from one speech to the next, how patterns emerge or disappear in the course of a debate. Uh, there's many ways into this question. There's many ways to think about this. Now that we've rephrased this story, not about the drama of the revolution, not about the historical process of the revolution, but simply the revolution as a source of pattern making, right, as the source of, of different structures that emerge and flow sort of intertextually between from one speaker to the next. Um, very simple thing you can do, and we gave it a name. We called it novelty. Uh, a novel speech let's say this red speech is novel. A novel speech is a speech that uh, contains patterns and combinations that violate or are very different from the speeches that have come just previously. So, you know, a very simple version of novelty would be, um, you know, the blue speech here uses patterns 7, 6, and 12, and the next speech might use patterns 7, 6, and 50. Okay, so in that case, the two speeches are actually sharing a great deal of their patterns. But a really novel speech, the first speech might be 7, 6, and 12, and the next speech might be, you know, 17, 19, and 54. And in this case, this speech has a certain set of patterns, the next speech has a very different set of patterns, and this next speech is extraordinarily novel. The speech has broken the pattern in the flow of the debate. So we have this measure of novelty, and of course we can then say, well, you know, a speech is more or less novel. Well, let's look at all the players, look at all the people in this room, all the, you know, particularly the famous characters. And there's sort of this natural thing you do, or you might think to do, which is like, I know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do leaders and followers. So I'm going to say followers in this system, they're low novelty people, right? You know, they're low energy guys, right? They're um, people who, when they give a speech, basically just kind of replicates the patterns of the speech that came before, you know? So Alexander gets up and he says, well, you know, I, I think we should be really concerned about, um, you know, the, um, uh, the powers of the state and in particular, the ways in which the powers of the state have been usurped by improper procedure, right? So then I'm a really boring guy. I'm a sort of a follower of Alexander. And I say, well, yes, I think it's, we really should talk about the procedural questions here and the powers of state. So I'm a follower. I'm, all I'm doing is replicating, imitating the speech patterns of the more powerful person that came before. And then your instinct is to say, okay, those are the followers with the leaders. These are the innovators, right? These are the, the crazy ones, the dreamers, right? These are the ones who break the patterns in the debate. These are the ones who bring new ideas in. So you're like, ah, it's like Robespierre, let's say, right? Robespierre, he's a, it turns out he is, a high novelty speaker. He's somebody who very often in the course of the debate, when Robespierre shows up to make a speech, it's patterns that have not yet appeared in that speech. He's bringing new things in to the discourse, right? The problem with that definition, the problem with that kind of cashing out leader and followers is that you can't tell the difference between Robespierre and a crazy person because there are two kinds of ways to break the flow of a debate, right? One is to be Robespierre and be like, well, you know, isn't this really about the rights of the man or isn't this really about, you know, the, the, the king as a, you know, as a moral failure? Um, and everyone thinks they're talking about like, you know, ecclesiastical property. But of course, another way to, to break the pattern is to say something insane. 
is to you know to not pay attention or to be totally off your off your rocker. So this very simplistic definition: followers are low novelty, leaders are high novelty. It can't quite work. So what we did was come up with a more nuanced definition, and it's mathematically beautiful, obviously, but roughly speaking, right? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to measure. We want to get a sense of power. We ended up calling it resonance. Um, a form of rhetorical power that we can measure simply by pattern making and pattern breaking, but it's a combination of two things. It's a combination both of how much you innovate, so how much you break the patterns of what's come before, so that's Robespierre, but also like animal, um, combined with how much your innovation is copied by others subsequently, right? So, um, you know, animal, the Muppet, has really high novelty because he just says something crazy, but um, the crazy thing he introduces into the debate is then ignored. It's not copied onwards. So it's this sort of one-off thing. Whereas someone like Robespierre, it turns out, not only does Robespierre break the pattern of the discussion, but he actually drags the later discussion along with him. People start imitating him as opposed to the thread of debate that's come before. So what we end up with is not this two-part division between the leaders and the followers, but instead a, a four-part division where you have, for example, people who are high novelty and then also let's call them high imitation, meaning they're imitated by others later. So this is somebody with a, that has high novelty and high imitation is a speaker, someone who introduces new ideas, who breaks the patterns, and the new patterns that he introduces, everyone in this data set is male, it turns out, uh, it's the revolution, French revolution, um, uh, you know, the person who introduces these new patterns um, is imitated by those who come later. So this is a high novelty, high imitation person with a great deal of power. Uh, but you now also have this sort of high novelty but low imitation person. Uh, this is a, a uh, you know, this is like the, the animal guy, right? This is, says something crazy and he introduces this pattern which nobody picks up and it drops away. So this is a speaker who introduces ideas, but then is ignored. Um, it's, there's four parts because of course you have high and low novelty and high and low rates of imitation. So you have, for example, low novelty and high imitation. So this is like your, you know, your good, you know, very often your good person, right? This is, you're keeping the discussion on track, right? Alexander was talking about enemies from within, and you're going to you know, pick up on that, and you're going to talk about enemies within, and you're going to keep the discussion on track because the next person is also going to do that. So your low novelty, you're preserving the pattern, but your high imitation, meaning that people are copying you, and you know, just as equivalently, they're copying the person before. Um, the final case is this sort of really sad group, right? This is the low novelty, low imitation people. So this is kind of odd, right? These are the people who copy the guy who came before them. But in fact, roughly, you know, when they do that, basically the conversation's over. And in fact, everyone moves on. So then there's a new pattern that comes up after them. So the, the intuition here is, you know, you're in this discussion and, you know, Alexander says something and then, you know, I say something, Alexander, that's really great, you know, I'm going to pick up on what you just said. And I say that and it's like I've killed the discussion. And now the next person is actually going to introduce something totally new. So this is sort of a four part division. Um, scientists love this, right? They call it the two by two, right? You go to a psych uh, talk and every psychologist, oh, I got a two by two, right? High novelty, low novelty, high imitation, low imitation. So you've got four spaces here. Who falls where? Let's just look sort of on the, on the largest possible scales. Um, high novelty, high imitation. These are, and you've had a little bit of a preview of this. These are key players. In fact, key players on the revolutionary left. So if you rank people, who's highest on this scale? Um, uh, uh, Pétion de Villeneuve and perhaps the most famous uh, revolutionary, Maximilien Robespierre. Many of these people are not only the pattern makers, pattern breakers in our information signal style analysis, but they're also part of the historical process very obviously. Um, another interesting group here in our two by two is the low novelty, high imitation group. So these are people that you might think of and you have sort of super versions of these people. These are people who are able to sort of by force of will keep the conversation on track, right? So they're able to, um, you know, there's a conversation, it's going, it's going. What they're able to do is find the patterns in the earlier part of that conversation, let's say reiterate them and have the rhetorical power 
to uh, preserve those patterns later. So they, uh, to a certain extent, copy what's come before, but they also have the authority to induce others later to continue that copying process. And in fact, people who show up in this sort of category here, they actually end up being a lot of the key players on the right wing. And so the right wing in this case is um, people who, for example, are interested in a, maybe a constitutional monarchy, right? Or, you know, not complete, you know, uh, radical cult of reason, execute the king sort of things, right? Uh, so um, what we've done here, and there's plenty of work in this paper, what we've done is just as in the case of the Old Bailey, just as in the case of the Russian diaries, we've given, we've gotten this sort of third view, this third view into a, an archive into a series of events, a, a view that is neither the narrative view, the literary view, let's say, the meaning-making view, nor is it the historical, uh, sociological, political uh, process view. But you might think of this as sort of, you know, the, seeing the French Revolution as a machine that makes patterns and identifying within this great machine, um, uh, you know, here, this is, you know, the, the novel and the resin, that's Robespierre, the novel and the resonant voices, right, versus, you know, the, those are sort of neither. It's actually very hard to find uh, people who are uh, neither novel nor resonant uh, in, in, the, in that famous painting of the French Revolution. Um, there's one or two, and I, that's, that's one of them there. So, um, welcome to Humanities Analytics. Thank you for joining us for our first uh, lecture together. Um, we've, uh, I've given you three examples. I've given you a great deal of 40,000 foot view uh, accounts of the sort of the actual technical details. But really the goal here has been to do two things. One is to give you a crash course in uh, what these ideas can do, just to give you a sense of where some of this work can go. Um, the the uh, new kind of view that it asks us or enables us to give, it's a view that is, it does not uh, replace, or I would even say doesn't necessarily augment, but provides a complementary view into the same things, a new window, a new lens with which to look at um, uh, a historical record, a literary text. Um, also, at the same time, and I imagine that many, uh, many of you are chomping at the bit for discussions this week, um, also a view of the complexity of these problems. Um, we, you know, uh, in each of these three papers, in each of these three scholarly investigations, we've done a great deal of operationalization. We've done a great deal of, um, of uh, this sort of hermeneutic cycle going back and forth between something deep like what it, you know the state and its monopoly on violence to what's the you know predictive power of the transcript and the indictment. We've gone back and forth to try to make this case, but that is perhaps the hardest question. The technical side, the programming side, is not something that we'll deal as much with in part because we hope that we'll whet your appetite for these things, but also more because we think the really deep questions, the really exciting ones and the really challenging ones are precisely at this intersection of the philosophical problem of analyzing these things, the scholarly questions we want to ask, and then the ways in which new computational, mathematical, technical um, uh, 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 innovations can help connect these things together. So thank you very much.